Alexei Filipenko is an American astrophysicist and professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focuses on supernovae and active galaxies at optical, ultraviolet, and near-infrared wavelengths. Filipenko developed and runs the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope which conducts the Lick Observatory Supernova Search. He was a member of both teams that discovered the accelerating expansion of the universe, propelled by mysterious dark energy, and is frequently featured on History Channel's The Universe programs. Filipenko received a Bachelor of Arts in Physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara and a Ph.D. in Astronomy from the California Institute of Technology. Please welcome Dr. Alex Filipenko. to be here this afternoon. My talk will be on cosmology. Now, cosmology is that subset of astronomy that deals with the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. We're interested in some of the grandest questions. What is the size of the universe? Is it infinite or does it wrap around itself somehow? What is the age of the universe? We now know the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Very old, but not infinitely old. What will be the fate of the universe? Will it continue to expand forever, or will it someday reverse its motion and come crashing bang back in on itself? How will the universe end? And we're also interested in the basic building blocks of the universe, the galaxies, gigantic collections of hundreds of billions of stars gravitationally bound together, stretching across tens or even hundreds of thousands of light years. We live in one such galaxy, the Milky Way, which would look much like this one if we could see it from the outside. There are galaxies throughout the universe. Here's one of my favorite photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope, part of what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Now this is a tiny but representative part of the sky. Imagine a grain of sand or a small pebble held at arm's length. Imagine how small that looks. That's the fraction of the sky represented by this photograph. Yet you can see there are thousands of galaxies there. Most of those little blobs are other galaxies, not stars in our own galaxy. Extrapolated over the whole sky, we estimate that there's something like 100 billion galaxies. And that's just in the parts of the universe that we can see. We now think the universe extends far, far beyond those parts we can see, and everywhere it's filled with galaxies. How did they form? How do they evolve with time? These two are among the central questions of cosmology. So it's a really fascinating field. Now, among the general public, present company excluded, there's considerable confusion between cosmology, the study of the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole, and cosmetology, the study of hairdos and facials. They do sound similar, but cosmology and cosmetology differ by an ET. Cosmetology has an extra ET, like the extraterrestrial. But to give you an example of this confusion, here's a copy of an ad that a colleague placed in my mailbox some time ago. Make cosmology your career. Training and supervision and hairstyling, blow drying, permanent waves, coloring and frosting, scalp cuts, uh, uh, where'd it go? Um, style, cu style cuts, basic cuts for further information and <laughs> interviews, call that number. Now, classes started last March, but I'm sure there will, there will be such classes in the upcoming quarter or semester. So if you want to do as I and many of my colleagues have done and get to the cutting edge of this field, you should take a course like this. Yeah, I, well, I'm sorry. These guys need a course not only on their own subject, but a course on spelling and proofreading, because in addition to foother here, you see hair flying up there. Anyway. A central figure in this field was Edwin Hubble, who in the late 1920s looked at other galaxies and found that they're moving away from us. And at a given time, right now, the more distant galaxies are moving away from us faster than the nearby galaxies. So here we are, the Milky Way galaxy, and all the other galaxies are moving away with the more distant ones moving faster than the nearby ones. The universe is expanding. And we're not at the center. It's not that other galaxies don't like us and that we smell or something, or maybe these other galaxies are lactose intolerant, you know, Milky Way galaxy, lactose intolerant. No, we think that this is a property of a uniformly expanding universe. 
Let me give you an example. Here's a one-dimensional universe made out of a rubber tube, that's space, and ping pong balls. Those are the galaxies. They don't expand. Galaxies are gravitationally held together so that they don't expand. As the universe expands, you can see that from the perspective of, say, the orange ping pong ball, all the others move away, so it thinks it's at the center. But the same can be said for any other ping pong ball. Each one sees the others moving away. And indeed, the more distant ping pong balls from any given ping pong ball move faster than the nearby ones because every bit of space expands. And the greater the amount of space there was to begin with, the greater is the total expansion. And this works for a finite universe or one that's infinite. So in fact, we live in a uniformly expanding universe with no unique center. Now, with today's great telescopes, we've measured the current rate of expansion of the universe. It's just some value. And you might think that's all there is to know. But in fact, there, isn't, there, there is something more to know, and that is the change in the rate of expansion with time. After all, the universe has galaxies with mass, and these galaxies pull on other galaxies. So they should slow down. They should retard the rate of expansion. Just as when I toss this apple up, the mutual gravitational attraction between the apple and the Earth slows it down. Indeed, if it slows it down enough, it'll stop and then cram come crashing back down. So if the universe is sufficiently dense, then the expansion rate will slow down so much that someday the universe will stop expanding and then recollapse in on itself, ending in a very dense, hot state, the opposite of the Big Bang. We call it the Big Crunch or the Gnab Gib. That's Big Bang backwards, right? Big Bang, Gnab Gib. <laughs> However, it could be that the universe is not sufficiently dense to ever halt the expansion. It could be that there's not enough matter per unit volume to slow down the expansion to a complete halt. In that case, the universe would keep on expanding forever. That's analogous to heaving this apple so fast that it escapes from the Earth. It never comes back. Now, gravity keeps on pulling on it, keeps on slowing it down, but never brings it to a stop and never brings it back in on itself. That would be an eternally expanding universe, one that becomes ever colder, darker, and more dilute. We would like to know the fate of the universe. What will it do in the future? And we can figure it out by examining the past history. For example, if the universe has been slowing down quickly with time, then it'll someday stop, reverse its motion, and come crashing back down. However, if we examine the past history and find that the universe has been slowing down very little, then in fact, it'll expand forever. It's like a universe expanding faster than the escape velocity. It's kind of like a, an apple thrown at greater than the escape velocity from Earth. So if you were to examine the past history, you could, in principle, predict the future. Now, how do you examine the history of the expansion rate? Well, you can look to great distances, galaxies that are a billion light years away, or four billion light years away, or nine billion light years away, are seen not as they are right now, but as they were one billion, four billion, nine billion years ago. It takes time for light to travel from one place to another. You see the sun as it was a little over eight minutes ago, not as it is right now. Even the typical bright stars you see, you see as they were some tens or hundreds of years ago. Light doesn't travel instantaneously fast. So if we look at galaxies that are very distant, we are effectively looking back in time. We're looking at a movie of the history of the universe. And encoded in the light from those galaxies is information about the expansion rate of the universe as it was long ago. Well, how do we determine distances of galaxies? How do we know that this galaxy is, say, 4 billion light years away? If we can find a star in it whose power, whose luminosity, whose oomph we know, and look at how bright it appears to be, we can determine the distance of that star. OK, this is just the same way that you de determine the distance of an oncoming car at night. You look at how bright the headlights appear to be, and you've calibrated the true power of the headlights of a car of known distance. But normally, ordinary stars can't be seen in galaxies. You need a special star, a supernova, an exploding star. Only a small minority of stars explode at the end of their lives. Our sun won't. But those that do, 
become millions or even billions of times the power of our sun and can be seen at vast distances. Here you can see a star, a single star exploding in that galaxy, becoming the equivalent of one billion suns. Again, if our sun were to do this, and it won't, then sunblock of 50 just wouldn't cut it. It wouldn't protect you. You'd need sunblock or supernova block of about a billion. Well, the point is, is that we have by now found and studied explosions of this sort in galaxies of known distance. Some galaxies are sufficiently nearby that we can see relatively ordinary stars. Look at how bright they appear, compare them with how luminous they really are, figure out their distance, and hence the distance of the galaxy in which they're located. If we find some exploding stars in galaxies of known distance and measure how bright they get, that's like calibrating the power of the headlight of the nearby car. That's your comparison, okay? And then you can go and look at very distant galaxies, search for supernovae within them, look at how bright they appear to be, thus calculate their distance, and thus know how far back in time you are looking. So roughly 15 years ago, two teams formed to find very distant supernovae and measure their distances. I actually was at one time a member of both teams, but my primary affiliation with, was with this one, the High Redshift Supernova Search Team. And the upshot of both teams, which announced their results in 1998, was that these distant exploding stars that were found were very, very faint, incredibly faint. Now you might say, well, yeah, but they're in these very distant looking, faint, small galaxies. You expect the supernovae to be faint. That's true, but these were fainter than they had any right to be. Suppose the universe were just one second old, and I toss this apple. In one second, the apple reaches some distance from my hand, but it's been slowing down because of Earth's gravity. If Earth's gravity were weaker, then in one second, that apple would travel farther because it wouldn't slow down as much. If Earth weren't present at all, and there were no other forces, the apple wouldn't slow down at all, and in one second, it would get to an even greater distance. Well, what we found was that the apple, the supernovae, the galaxies in which they're located, are at a greater distance than they could have reached had they not been slowing down at all. In other words, it almost looks as though those galaxies have been accelerating away from us. If you attached a rocket to the apple and you go zoom like that, then it can get to a greater distance in a given time than it could reach at a constant speed. So instead of measuring an anticipated deceleration, a slowing down, we seem to have measured an acceleration of the universe, a speeding up with time in the past four or five billion years. And the headline that came out was, astronomers see a cosmic anti-gravity force at work. We use this term anti-gravity hesitantly because people ask us, can we attach this stuff, whatever it is, to our cars and levitate over San Francisco traffic jams? No, we cannot, I'm sorry. Anyway, that was February 1998. By the end of the year, the editors of Science Magazine proclaimed this to be the single most important discovery in all areas of science that year, because it seemed to be so fundamental. And the caricature of Einstein looks surprised here, not because he's blowing universes out of his pipe. You may not have known, but that's where universes come from, from the pipes of theoretical physicists. But rather, he's surprised because the single universe is expanding faster and faster with time. He's doubly surprised because he has a sheaf of papers here on which there's an equation. Lambda equals 8 pi g, Newton's constant, times the density of the vacuum. Now you might say the density of the vacuum. Why did they invite this guy from Berserkly to give a TEDx talk, you know? <laughs> you were taught on your mother's knee that the vacuum is zilch, zero, nothing. How can it have a non-zero density? Well, first of all, I'm just the messenger. Einstein came up with the idea. And the reason he came up with the idea way back in 1917 is that at that time, people thought that the universe is static, neither collapsing nor expanding. Yet, to counteract the force of gravity between two galaxies, you would need some sort of a repulsive effect acting in the opposite direction with exactly the same magnitude, the same amount. Just as gravity is pulling down on this apple, if my hand is pulling up on it with an equal force, it remains stationary. If one or the other dominates, then the apple moves. Well, Einstein didn't like this. It seemed like 
a fudge factor, an arbitrary fudge factor, and there was no experimental evidence in laboratories for this weird repulsive effect, this cosmological constant. And it implied a non-zero repulsive energy of the vacuum. So he never liked this. 12 years later, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe isn't static after all. It's expanding. So the whole physical and philosophical motivation for the cosmological constant vanished. Einstein renounced it, supposedly as the biggest blunder of his career. So here he is, sad that he ever introduced the cosmological <laughs> constant. What have we done? We've resurrected the idea, not to give a static universe, but one which on the largest scales, over billions of light years, is expanding faster and faster with time. So here in this room, the down arrow dominates. In our solar system, the down arrow dominates. In our Milky Way galaxy, the down arrow dominates. But over hundreds of millions or billions of light years, the up arrow begins to dominate and it accelerates the expansion of the universe. Instead of his biggest blunder, it could have been his greatest triumph. And he might be quite surprised <laughs> if he were alive right now. So what is this stuff? What is the weird stuff that's accelerating the universe? It's certainly not the visible stars and galaxies. They all exert an attractive force. There's also dark matter in the universe, okay? It also ex exerts an attractive effect. We just don't know exactly what it is, but it's pervasive in the universe. This has to be something new. We call it dark energy, perhaps regrettably, because if there's one equation people on the street know, it's E equals MC squared. So I'm repeatedly asked, is dark energy the same thing as dark matter? No, dark matter pulls, dark energy, whatever it is, pushes. And this stuff over the whole volume of the universe is the dominant stuff of the universe. Almost three quarters of the matter energy content of the universe is this dark energy and we don't know what it is. Most of the rest is dark matter, and we don't know what that is either. We're made of atoms. We're made out of the 4% that's normal and the 0.4% that's easily visible. We're the debris of the universe, the afterthought of creation. That's not to say you're not important. You are to yourselves and your loved ones, but you are not made of the dominant stuff of the universe. And we don't know exactly what that dominant stuff is. It could be all sorts of weird quantum fluctuations or something, but there are hundreds of ideas and theoretical physicists are now working on them. It's a cottage industry trying to figure out what the dark energy is. Some say it's the most important unsolved problem in all of physics. Well, you might say, maybe the data are wrong, maybe the interpretation is wrong. If it were only based on supernovae, I would agree. But now, 12 years later, there's a lot of other evidence that either the universe is filled with dark energy of a repulsive sort, or Einstein's general theory of relativity is wrong on the largest scales. Also a very exciting conclusion. Part of the evidence comes from a baby picture of the universe, a picture of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old. Analyzing all these little fluctuations in density and temperature also suggests that there's a new component to the universe. Also, those fluctuations grow with time under the influence of gravity, forming galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies and the voids in between them, as seen in this computer simulation. What you get when you include dark matter and dark energy is better agreement with the observed distribution of galaxies and clusters of galaxies in the universe than if you were to ignore the presence of dark energy. So there's a lot of evidence now pointing to this dark energy. We think it's real or relativity is wrong. So what will be the future of the universe? Well, if the dark energy remains dominant and repulsive, the universe will expand forever faster and faster and faster with time, a runaway universe. But of course, since we don't know what the dark energy is, maybe its sign will change in the future and it might become gravitationally attractive. Nevertheless, Robert Frost apparently knew of the two possibilities, an eternally expanding universe ending up cold and dark, like ice, or a collapsing universe, one ending up dense and fiery and hot, like fire. He wrote the poem, Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So Frost would prefer 
the recollapsing universe. But if he had to perish twice, then one eternally expanding ending in ice would be OK. And that's perhaps appropriate given his name, Robert Frost. Well, to conclude, <laughs> let me give you a call to action. We can use astronomy and cosmology as a hook to get kids interested in technology. Most of them won't become astronomers. That's probably a good thing. But they'll go off into applied fields in engineering and computer science. But the hook is astronomy and cosmology. So spread the word about this wonderful stuff. Moreover, there's an amazing puzzle waiting to be answered. What is the nature of the dark energy? As I said, some people think it's the number one problem in physics today. And it may provide a clue to the ultimate goal of theoretical physics, a unified quantum theory of gravity. Thank you very much.